Hello everyone and a really warm welcome to this Ovarian Cancer Action webinar. It's fantastic to have you all with us uh, today because we're going to be discussing what progress has been made over the past few decades and crucially, I guess, more crucially, what the future actually holds for better diagnosis and treatment of this really awful disease. Survival rates for ovarian cancer today are still where breast cancer was back in the 1970s. I find that statistic to be frankly quite astonishing. So I think to start off with, it would be great to understand some of the background behind that and also what progress we really have seen concerning ovarian cancer in the last uh, 20 to 50 years. Uh, Ian, perhaps I could start with you and start on a, I guess on a positive note. What progression have you seen in the past say 20 to 30 years? There have been really two major improvements in treatment that are translating through to improve survival. Uh, the main one is introduction of a, a class of drugs we call PARP inhibitors. Originally, we thought they would only work in women with hereditary ovarian cancer, but through the research that we and others did, we demonstrated that they would have activity in half, maybe even two thirds of women with high grade ovarian cancer. And I'm delighted to say that two of those drugs are now available freely on the NHS for women at the time of diagnosis. And the third one um, is likely to become available uh, in the next few months. The other big um, advance we've made is understanding the role of surgery. Um, and again, I'm very fortunate of working at the Ovarian Cancer Action Research Center and my colleagues at Hammersmith Hospital, where we've really taken ovarian cancer surgery to the next level um, and that's something that we're appreciating and trying to spread that message and that practice around the country. I think one of the big big steps forward for me over the last couple of years has been the work we were involved in to co-fund um, with some partners NHS England to audit and publish uh, data from across NHS trusts in England on both the treatment they were giving to patients and then survival rates. We've now got really robust evidence and we can really see the difference between uh, what's happening in different places. And I think that's a really solid basis for us to move forward on, um, particularly in that sort of knowing what treatment patients are getting and then connecting that to their outcomes, which is essentially around survival. So I sort of feel hugely positive about the fact there's real recognition about women's healthcare being overlooked. And we see so many examples of that, whether that's around menopause or women in childbirth or period poverty. Um, and we've sort of seen it through COVID as well. But I, I also think that, uh, you know, cancer has benefited from that. There's been much more conversation about women's treatment and, and sort of women's um, diagnosis around sort of cancer and that can only be good for ovarian cancer I think. We've obviously got the discovery of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes and they are specific mutations that we know are, are linked to ovarian cancers and that run through families. We're also now moving to um, a uh, using and sequencing the whole genomes of an individual. So not just looking at specific parts of, of somebody's genome, but looking at the whole genome. Um, and really that's been something that has evolved over the last, uh, over the last decade, particularly in this country. Um, the government supported a project called the 100,000 Genomes Project, um, which was a research project that was um, delivered to look at uh, the benefits of uh, whole genome sequencing and sequencing somebody's whole genome uh, for families with rare disease and cancer. And really that has given the platform and the clinical evidence for us within the NHS to start looking at whole genome sequencing as part of routine clinical care. That all sounds incredible and amazingly exciting and looking to the future looks much more positive. But to balance that, to, as I said at the very start, to look at where the diagnosis and treatment of ovarian cancer is right now compared to, say, breast cancer or cervical cancer. I mean, we're all aware that ovarian cancer is lagging very far behind. And I'd really like to understand why that is so. I mean, Ian, perhaps I could go back to you. Why is it that the treatments for ovarian cancer seem to be so far behind? The core of what we give to patients 
hasn't changed in 15 years. So surgery remains the cornerstone. Um, and carboplatin chemotherapy, the reason we're still using it, actually, it's still the best drug we've got. Many people will know that by the time women are diagnosed with ovarian cancer, 70% of them have disease that has spread into the abdomen, so stage three. Uh, and that is always going to be challenging to treat. So in breast cancer and cervix cancer and many, many other cancers, we identify patients when their disease is relatively early. Why is that? It's because, uh, it, for example, in breast cancer, breast lumps tend to be relatively easy to feel and mammography is relatively good at identifying them early. We've got a, a cervical cancer screening program that can pick up pre invasive cancer, we have no program in ovarian cancer. So the, the, the reason why 70% of women have advanced disease by the time they know anything about it, by the time we're able to diagnose them, is that it spreads incredibly rapidly. So uh, you can have women with almost minimal disease in the ovaries, but they've got multiple areas of disease in the abdomen. And so um, we, we need to make a huge effort in how can we identify high-grade ovarian cancer in particular as early as possible. If we could find a way to sort of screen for ovarian cancer, that would be a major breakthrough, clearly, and would be a game changer. Um, and so in the absence of that, we do need to find ways to diagnose earlier. I think particularly from a scientific perspective, there are a limited number of variants that you look for within ovarian cancer. I think one of the other issues um, around genomic testing is um, not only do we test for inherited ovarian cancer, which you can do from taking a sample of somebody's blood, you also want to test their actual tumour and take a sample of their tumour to define the, uh, the, the genomic analysis of the tumour. It can be quite difficult to get tumour samples from ovarian cancer patients that are of a high enough quality to then carry on and do genomic testing on. Let's look at the positives now going forward, Ian. What are you hoping might be achieved, optimistically, I'm, I'm sure, but realistically as well, might be achieved in, in the coming decades? So, um... The, the first thing is clearly we will tr treat, in 10 years time, we will treat the five different types of ovarian cancer differently from each other. That is starting to happen and that will continue to happen. Um, uh, clear cell carcinoma of the ovary, which is relatively rare, but occurs in younger women and occurs on the background of a disease called endometriosis. 10% of women have endometriosis. It's a disabling, painful condition. And a small percentage of those go on to get um, ovarian cancer that is different from the majority of ovarian cancers and we're beginning to develop very specific treatments for clear cell. The big drive will be in high-grade ovarian cancer. As I said, approximately half of patients will benefit from these drugs called PARP inhibitors, but that means half don't and there's a massive need to identify treatments for those women. And that's a huge focus of work in my uh, laboratory in the Ovarian Cancer Action Research Centre. Third progress is going to be understanding how we can use immunotherapy, immunological treatments. You will have heard many of you of these new immune type therapies that have revolutionised the treatment of lung cancer and melanoma. Depressingly, they don't work in most cases of ovarian cancer, and we still don't really quite know why, um, we're going to need to develop a new generation of immunological therapies for ovarian cancer. And that's going to be a big challenge, but I think that's going to be our third advance uh, in the next 10 years. And the fourth advance, obviously, is understanding why cancer comes back and becomes resistant to chemotherapy. And that's a big focus of the work that um, I've been doing um, at the at the research center. All of those by working collaboratively, cooperatively, nationally, internationally, getting centers of excellence to talk to each other. I think those are realistic goals. So I think there's a real opportunity for genomics to play a real part in this, but I think we've also got some uh, developments that need to happen and some transformation that needs to continue. Over the last um, four or five years, there's been a big transformation programme within uh, the NHS around genomics. So one of the things that I think was a, a real barrier and has been mentioned in other contexts before is around equity of access. And we need to make sure that 
no matter where a patient is in the country, they get timely access to the right genomic test. So what we've been doing as part of the NHS uh, Genomic Medicine Service Programme is we've done a big uh, transformation of the laboratory infrastructure. So we now have a consolidated uh, laboratory infrastructure across the country and they are responsible for providing the genomic testing for their population. And for me, it's a combination of several things which we know um, could all add up to make a difference in slightly different ways. So clearly the research is, you know, is, is fundamental to that. And it's only really, you know, thinking about this through the last couple of years that I've realised um, what a jewel in the crown the centre is. Um, and, and clearly we invest in research in other places as well, and it's fantastic. We only invest in world-class research, but the centre gives us an opportunity to really build on something that's got some amazing critical mass and excellence there. Combining that, I think, with making much more noise and creating understanding about ovarian cancer, because it, it really pains me that women and men don't know the symptoms. And I understand why there's not an, enough noise being made. If we could get women to their GPs earlier and diagnosed earlier, and Ian talked about this, um, and move them from a stage four diagnosis to a stage two, that could save, you know, up to 50% of those women's lives. And, you know, those women know they've got symptoms. They just need to be able to put a name to it and have a, have a conversation with their GP about it and, and, and push for it and have the confidence to sort of do that. We know they've got the symptoms earlier on. So I, I think that piece is really critical, particularly in the absence of um, a sort of early screening um, mechanism. And then the final thing, you know, and, and sort of um, Alex has talked about this a lot, which is preventing um, hereditary cancer. Again, you know, we know the numbers on this. And if we can identify more people who carry the BRCA mutation, for example, and get them earlier interventions, access to testing and the right information so they can make choices um, about their, you know, they can reduce their lifetime risk. And that could save up to 1,400 lives in ovarian cancer alone, let alone breast cancer and prostate cancer. For World Ovarian Cancer Day, which was in um, May, we just ran a campaign on Twitter um, where we had uh, Twitter accounts following 7,500 women, which is the number of women who get diagnosed each year, following them with a symptom. And, and most of those, those people took no notice. Um, and then we sort of did a reveal at the end. And, you know, we know from the messaging that we've had that that has provoked people to go to their GP or to talk to their friends about it. It's not easy, but it's doable and we just need to not give up. Uh, but it's one of a sort of several things that need to be done. You know, the key thing that will make the difference in the long term is the investment in research, I think, because um, we need more treatments. We need different treatments. Charities underpin actually the largest single amount of research in the UK. The British public are phenomenally generous um, and charitable funded research um, is considerably more in terms of pounds than government funded research. And clearly Ovarian Cancer Action are a charity and they are fantastically generous to my team and me and I'm incredibly grateful to them and to their donors. My thanks to Ian, Alex and Kerry for taking the time to uh, talk to us um, about ovarian cancer. Thank you to everyone who's also attended this session. Um, I hope you found it as interesting as I did and as helpful as I did. And thank you also for the support that you've been showing for Ovarian Cancer Action. Until we see you again, goodbye. <laughs>